What's up guys and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you guys are new here, then what's up? My name's Erica. Hey ya! How you doing? For today's video, I am incredibly excited to speak to the author of this gorgeous book that is sitting right next to me, that is Clytemnestra, which means that I am speaking to the wonderful Costanza Cassati. Now, Costanza has written this gorgeous retelling of Clytemnestra, which is really, honestly, such an original take of the Greek mythology that you can find in Aeschylus, that you can find for a character in Euripides. Even in Homer, Clytemnestra is referenced as being the queen of Mycenae. She watches over the kingdom when Agamemnon, her husband, goes off to the Trojan War. And this book not only goes into that part of the Greek myth, but also it's really such an origin story of her character. It tells us about her life back in Sparta with her sister Helen, her two brothers, Castor and Pollux, how they grew up together, if they get on. Then obviously her marriage to Agamemnon, and then obviously when he leaves, her raging affair, there's no other way of saying that, her raging affair with his cousin Aegisthus. So that's all the fun stuff that we get into in this book. But with all that being said, we should probably hand this over to you, Costanza. Actually, just before, just before I say that, just that you guys know, it is currently on and off raining when I'm filming this, so the lighting might be a little bit off, but that's just a side note. So currently it's quite cloudy. It might get a bit lighter later on. Um, it's just, I hope so, at least. Anyways, off topic, Costanza, why don't we start off in the way that I normally start all of these uh, talks? And that is by you explaining to us your classics background, because even though you were born in the US, you went to school in Italy and you went to a liceo classico. So you had all of this, this, you know, classics background basically coming into this novel and this rich history. Can you tell us about discovering the classics and ultimately how you ended up writing this novel? Absolutely. So uh, I was born in the US actually, but I grew up in Italy and in Italy, some people attend what we call a liceo classico, which is basically a high school where classics are compulsory. So you say in this type of high school, you study ancient Greek, Latin philosophy, Italian literature, English literature for five years. You do other subjects as well, of course. <laughs> I always say this to people I can count, but... <laughs> But the main focus is um, classics, so specifically ancient Greek and Latin. And so what we do is when we're 14 years old, which is really young, we start translating um, the ancient text. So we start translating from the ancient Greek and Latin. And that's how I became familiar with the myths, um, specifically with the character Clytemnestra. I encountered her for the first time when I was about 16 or 17. And we were studying the Orisea, which uh, is a trilogy of plays by Aeschylus and specifically I was specifically interested in the Agamemnon which is the first play of the Oresteia it was first performed in 458 BC in Athens classical Athens and despite the title Clytemnestra is the main character of the Agamemnon and I remember studying this play and thinking what an extraordinary character Clytemnestra actually was and I think my first reaction to that story was just rage <laughs> I was really really angry not just for how not just for all the things that Clytemnestra endured in the myth, but also for how she was perceived by modern audiences. Um, you know, for people who are not familiar with her, she's very famous for, um, essentially for being a husband killer, for being a bad wife. Uh, she kills her husband, Agamemnon, when he comes back from the Trojan War. And Agamemnon was the leader of the Greek forces during the Trojan War. Um, and the reason why she does that um, is because he had sacrificed their daughter, Iphigenia, um, for a puff of wind so that the Greek fleet could sail for Troy before the war. Um, so I became familiar with this story quite young. And then I think for years and years, I just I just kept feeling that anger, kept feeling that rage. And I really wanted to retell her story. Well, to just tell her story, really. Um, and um, I studied her again at university. But I think in the, you, know, you were asking about my classical background. I think when I was studying the classics and I was that young, when you're 14 and 15 and 16 years old, you study them in quite a passive way uh, because you're just too young to understand, too, too young to ask questions um, in a way. And so I just remember I was really, for me, it was really about the language. I learned how to translate the text and it was, it really helped me with my kind of cultural research later on in that I already knew how these people thought about, you know, love and death and vengeance. Uh, so I had this kind of concepts in my mind already in a way, but I, when I was younger, I didn't really think about 
I didn't ask myself questions in terms of how the characters felt. And I think it was quite interesting because Clyde and Astro was the only character that I, well, there are so many amazing characters from the Greek myth and I, I love them all now. And I went back to the ancient sources uh, in the past few years. But when I was younger, she was, for me, the most unfor unforgettable female character from the Greek myth. And, and that's probably because her story is so dramatic. Uh, some parts of her story are so horrifying that even, you know, like a 15 year old can't, study her story in a passive way you know uh you, you have an emotional reaction when you learn about her um whether you like her or not um so so yeah that's my that's my classical background story so you started writing this book about five years ago Am I mistaken? Uh, even more i think six years ago now yeah six years ago okay so i really wanted to ask you about this because writing so long ago this was way before we had this boom of greek mythology this was way before we had this boom of clytemnestra and electra story coming to the forefront except not even Haynes, like not yeah I, I was gonna say like yeah we had some natalie haynes but we didn't really still have in the way that you've really like class one to clytemnestra and we still don't yours is so different except you didn't know what was already coming so for you coming into this this must have been really jarring but also really lucky that you're like well mine is so different to everybody else just by chance i love the way you framed that question because so many people like so many readers uh keep telling me that my clytemnestra version is so different from all the others but also kind of the most similar to the clytemnestra they already had in mind uh but yeah so i when i was writing this i was familiar with uh the song of achilles cersei hadn't come, when i started writing this cersei hadn't come out yet um and i had read uh children of jocasta by natalie haynes because i I used to go to her events um, uh, while doing my master's. And um, <laughs> yeah, it's quite funny. Even when I was submitting the novel to agents, I remember so many agents were telling me, I love your take on the story. Uh, it's perfect for this trend. This trend is about to explode, but you're doing it in such a different way that we don't know whether it's going to be successful or not. Um, obviously, then my agent, my actual agent, she was like, oh, I love this story specifically because it is different. Um, and it works because it's more, you could read it as historical fiction more than a mythical retelling. You could read it as an origin story for the Agamemnon. You could read it as so many different things. Um, but yeah, so when I was writing it, I just... I was not thinking about writing a story that was different from other story. It was just about, you know, writing like that. It started with writing like an extra story first and foremost. And then there were other things that I wanted to um, to explore first, as I said before, rage, this kind of idea of vengeance. Um, I was also really interested in female power and ambition. It's one of the big themes of the novel. I think most of the time when authors um, tell or retell Clytemnestra's story, they focus on the vengeance aspect, which makes perfect sense because her story is a vengeance story. Uh, but I was really interested in the fact that she was a ruler. Um, one of the first things that we learn about her when we read the Agamemnon, uh, which was one of my many sources, but my main uh, source of inspiration, um, is the fact that she has been ruling the city of Mycenae for 10 years. And, you know, in the Greek myth, there are so many extraordinary harems, but not so many rulers. Usually the women are, you know, sisters of rulers or wives of rulers. Um, and, you know, when I think about other queens, I think about the Amazonian queens or Hypsipyle, the queen of Lamnos, uh, you know, characters I, I love and adore. And Clytemnestra is one of the few actual rulers and she's quite good at it. I mean, in the, in the Oresteia, well, in the Agamemnon, <laughs> um, she's not loved. Uh, but she is definitely respected. And I usually, I, I always quote this line from the Agamemnon. Um, at some point, the elders, um, who are kind of the counselors of the queen or queen in this case, and the chorus of the play, they tell Clytemnestra that they respect her power. And they use the word, the ancient Greek word kratos, which means political power. And it's never associated with a woman. Well, usually not associated with a woman. Um, so I was really interested in the fact that she was a ruler, um, which probably... <laughs> is why I had a kind of different take on the story. Um, and I was also interested in writing a family saga or and also a story about sisterhood. So I was interested in bringing together all the different myths and weaving them in a way that felt kind of fresh. So um, Castor and Polydeuces, Clytemnestra's brothers play a big part in uh, in the book. Timandra, Clytemnestra's younger sister, who is just like a passing mention in the, in the source, in the ancient sources, uh, also plays a big part. So I think it was not, well, if, if I were writing this book now, I would have to ask myself, how do I make this different? But because the books weren't out yet, I just wrote a story that felt kind of 
the, the most honest to me. And that's how it worked out. But it worked out well, so I'm not complaining. I agree. And something that I loved there about your book is that you did use such like fleeting references from other sources that I saw where I was like, ooh, oh, I didn't know that, you know, we were going to start including this part of the story or this character or even like the odd hints to like the Iliad. Obviously, I'm going to point out the Iliad because that's my favorite book. But like you had lots of really odd lines to the Iliad, like one in, um, you know, the, that part, I'm trying not to ruin it, but I guess this doesn't ruin it. No, it's when fine. you're sending, <laughs> when like Helen and Clyde are sending letters to each other and there are like odd references to little parts of the Iliad where I was like, hello. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so as I said before, the main kind of sources were, well, you have the Orsaya, then you have the Iliad, the Odyssey. The Odyssey is quite interesting to me because Claudia Nestra is a passing mention. She appears in uh, book 11 and book 24. Um, and she uh, is not an actual character. She's just mentioned by Agamemnon and he keeps insulting her. Uh, there are so many, so many quotes that are actually quite funny. Um, in book 11, Odysseus travels to the underworld, meets Agamemnon, and uh, Agamemnon has just been killed by Clytemnestra. And they start talking about their wives. And after praising Penelope, um, Agamemnon starts insulting Clytemnestra and he says that she brands with a foul name, the brood of womankind. And he says, um, there's nothing more deadly, bestial, than a woman set on works like these. What a monstrous thing she plotted, slaughtered her own lawful husband. Which is hysterical. He he calls himself lawful. But yeah, apart from that, he, like in the, the very first time she's mentioned, Clayton was mentioned in the um, literary tradition, in the Western literary tradition, she's called bestial, monstrous, deadly. Um, and later on again, he says that she brands, she, she bathes the whole brood of woman kind of shame. So, um, so it's just a passing, passing mention, but I think, you know, studying those sources is incredibly important um, to give you an idea of how this woman was perceived. Um, and then you're, you're talking about, you know, the little references um, that I have taken from other sources. An example of this is um, the the prophecy. Uh, in the book, there is a prophecy about the daughters, the three daughters of Lida. Um, Lida was Clytemnestra's mother, Helen's mother, Timandra's mother. And um, so I found this, I was researching the character of Timandra. This is just an example. I have like a hundred others. But when I was researching the character of Timandra, because she is not famous at all in the, in the Greek myth, um, the only thing I found was this prophecy that appears um, in Hesiod, but also the poets Tezicorus. And they say that um, Tindareus, king of Sparta, forgot to uh, sacrifice the goddess Aphrodite. And so she punished him by making sure that um, his daughters uh, were basically deserters of their lawful husbands and that they were all going to marry twice and thrice. Um, and so I, I found that to be incredibly interesting and I wanted to weave that in. And that's just an example of like a tiny thing that um, a classicist would notice, but, you know, uh, just an average reader wouldn't notice. But I don't care. I wanted to make sure that the book could appeal to readers who are not familiar with the Greek myths, but also to readers who are classicists and who can read the book and be like, oh, yes, I noticed this is from the Iliad, this is from the Odyssey. Uh, another example is in the letters, you, you were mentioning this before, um, there's a letter written by Helen um, to Clytemnestra. Uh, she is already in, in Troy, and at some point she goes to see the battle um, from the walls and she looks down and says, I can't see my brothers. Castor and Polydeus says, I pray they aren't dead. That's a direct quote from the um, from book three, I believe, of the Iliad. Um, you're like, yes, <laughs> nodding. <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, the, the reason why I wanted to, to reference these little lines from ancient sources was because when I was writing the book, the biggest challenge for me was, um, realizing that I had to write, to create a narrative that was true to the sources, but also quite fresh. I knew that some people, classicists, people who love the Greek myth, uh, were going to be familiar with the story already. And I wanted to make sure that they were entertained and that they kept turning the pages and, and um, kept getting excited about the narrative. And so I think and this is true not only for it was true not only for the narrative, but for the characters as well, because Helen is one of the main characters in my novel, and she's been portrayed countless times. She's, I think, the most famous female character from the Greek myth in my novel. Then you have Odysseus, you have Agamemnon, 
Kleidinashwa is also famous in her own right. For classicists, she is incredibly famous. You, you know, even people who are not that familiar with the Greek myth, they will have heard of Kleidinashwa in some way or another. Um, and so I think my my solution to this kind of challenge was going back to the ancient sources, but not simply retelling um, the Agamemnon or, you know, the Iliad or the Odyssey, uh, even though there is no such thing as a simple retelling. But I, I wanted to, you know, tell Kleidinashwa's story and then also... Um, focus on things that people might not really be familiar with. And, you know, because I was talking about Helen, Helen is probably the perfect example of this. To write her, I I drew on, well, a lot of Euripides, uh, Helen by Euripides, the Trojan women by Euripides, and the Odyssey as well. Um, I was specifically interested in the contrast between a younger Helen and an older Helen. Um, Helen, I think, throughout the centuries has always been portrayed as this kind of vain, manipulative uh, character. She's always hated. When she's not hated, she is just considered superficial. Um, I love Helen. I'm, I'm personally quite obsessed with Helen. Uh, it is also quite interesting to me, quite interesting to me that people think of the relationship between Helen and Clytemnestra as Clytemnestra being jealous of Helen, just because Helen is beautiful. but they grew up in Sparta and strength was the thing that was valued in Sparta rather than beauty for Helen beauty is kind of a curse rather than a blessing. Um, and so I think most of the time Helen is quite slippery, quite hard to pin down. So um, going back to Euripides in the play Helen, there are a couple of quotes that I absolutely love that I used to build her kind of younger self. And one is when Helen says, uh, the god Zeus tricked my mother into bed. Um, obviously, most things about Helen are contested, her parentage, her relationships with men. There are so many different versions of Helen uh, going to try. You know, in the Iliad, she feels guilty. So obviously, uh, it is implied that she ran away. In other sources, she was kidnapped. Uh, and that there is yet another version where Helen actually never went to try at all. Uh, but, you know, what went to try was her lookalike, her idol, and when she was, while well, she was shipped up to Egypt. So um, that little quote just made me think about a young Helen, a child who is quite insecure, who doesn't really know about her, her parents, who um, is quite frustrated as well. And there was another quote in uh, the play Helen by Euripides, where she says, all my life, people called me Teras which um, is an ancient Greek word that means portent and, and freak, wonder and monster. And so those are just a couple of examples that helped me create uh, the younger version of Helen, who is quite dependent on her sister, who worships her sister, but needs protection at all times. And then for the older version, um, I, I just love, there is a moment in the Odyssey when... Uh, I think it's book four, when Telemachus, Odysseus' son, travels to Sparta, he meets with Menelaus and, and Helen, and um, he's telling his story, he's quite distressed, and at some point Helen asks her slaves to just uh, put drugs <laughs> into, their, <laughs> into their drinks. She wants to drug them, she just drugs them. Um, and it's quite, I think, interesting because you see this woman who uh, has this sort of silent power. She um, she really manages and manipulates the situation uh, and you don't even realize what she's doing because she does everything in the shadows. Um, so that was something that, you know, helped me create the older version of Helen and then also in the Trojan Women by Euripides. That was another play that I really kind of studied and analyzed to, to write my version of Helen. Um, there's a moment when Troy has fallen and... Um, the Trojan women ask, well, specifically Hecabe, a former queen of Troy, asks Menelaus to uh, to kill Helen. She says, you have to kill your wife because wherever she looks, she brings death. She's a bringer of agony. She destroys everything uh, she touches. And so Menelaus goes to Helen and tells her, well, I've been sent to kill you. I'm paraphrasing here. That's not how the play goes. And, <laughs> and, um, and Helen gives the most incredible speech, which uh, literally sounds like a legal defense. She starts listing all the reasons why she didn't cause the Trojan War, but actually it was Menelaus' fault for leaving her alone with a foreign prince. It was Echabe's fault for um, not killing her son, even when it was when, when a prophet uh, told her that um, he would be the downfall of Troy. It was the goddess's fault for the judgment of Paris, you know, and she lists all the things. And by the end of her speech, Menelaus just looks at her and goes like, 
I will deal with you later. He da- he really doesn't know what to say because she just literally just outclassed him. And um, it is just a very funny moment. And if you, I think if you take that play and just compare that version of Helen to the Clytemnestra of the play Agamemnon, you really see how those two women are sisters. And so I was interested in just really highlighting how clever they are, how articulate they are, how cunning they are, and how as older women, how confident and unapologetic they are. Absolutely, it was. It really gave the vibe of like, influenced and infused with ancient Greek mythology because you hit all the beats, but all the scenes around that, like you had, you know, scenes between Helen and her brothers and scenes between like Clytemnestra and her first husband. And, you know, all of these scenes that we don't get, but we see reference to in the myths. So you hit all the beats, but then everything in between those beats were here's a scene where she's going to talk to her father. And I'm like, oh, what happens here? Like, I'm, I'm curious to see how Lita reacts to this too, you know? So it was like, as you were saying, like, I got to enjoy it as well as everybody else who doesn't know that myth because they still get the most important part from the myth, from the book. Yeah, no, totally. That is something that was really interesting in doing. And, you know, as you say, you just mentioned Clytemnestra's first husband, for example. That is something else that is usually um, that people don't really know about Clytemnestra, but it is taken from Iphigenia and Aulis, just a small line where Clytemnestra talks to Agamemnon. And, well, we're not going to spoil the story here, but she kind of explains in just one line why she, how she came to marry Agamemnon when actually she had a husband. Um before already and i think this whole idea of adding scenes that are not there in the ancient sources that are not there in the original mythology comes from me just being interested in doing you know i was talking about this cultural research before this idea of reading the ancient sources so that you while asking yourself questions such as what, what does this scene, what does this interaction tell tell us about, you know, um, Helen or Helen's reaction to Helen's uh, feelings about her mother and her father? And I have this idea of, you know, doing a huge amount of research. And this is something that I do whenever I write a, a historical novel. I'm doing this for my new novel as well. I, I just do so much research because I love doing it. But then there comes a point uh, for every writer where you, when you feel the need to just put all your research onto the page and that's when you know that the novel is is not working because if you put all the research that you do into your scene the readers will be bored and the readers well maybe not every reader probably <laughs> i wouldn't be bored because i love classics and i'm such a nerd so i would be like oh yes i love this i love this preference but sometimes i think a good like historical novel or myth retelling needs to have just what is on the page is just the 10% of your research, whereas the 90% is just not there. And I think all those other scenes, I they started out as me just trying to figure out how these characters would talk to each other. So there are a lot of scenes between Clytemnestra and Odysseus, for instance. And for me, that was just a character study, like an exploration of these two characters. Um, specifically, I was interested in how both of them are quite cunning. Um, Clytemnestra in the Agamemnon in the play, she is incredibly cunning, incredibly clever. Whenever there's a confrontation between her and her husband or the elders, she always outsmarts them, always outclasses them. Um, at some point, this is a scene that I particularly love in in the play Agamemnon. At some point, she paints this image of herself as a, a lonely, wretched woman who wanted to commit suicide so many times while her husband was away. We know this isn't true. This is just her um, coming up with an explanation for why her son isn't in the palace. Um, her name, Clytemnestra, according to some people, means famous for her cunning. It comes from the ancient Greek Clutus, which means famous for, and Medomai, which means to plot, to plan, to be cunning. Uh, and Odysseus is probably, is obviously famous for his cunning. And so I was really interested in uh, just, you know, having the two characters in a room, uh, out, outclassing each other and outsmarting each other. Um, so it, they started out as character studies and then I just ended up including all of those scenes because I thought yes this is something that people haven't seen because it's not in the original mythology but it makes sense because it still kind of follows it respects how these characters are portrayed in the ancient sources. I loved the scenes with Odysseus and even more so because Diomedes makes an appearance in your book 
So let's talk about passing appearance. He still makes an appearance and I'm taking it because no one ever includes him. And so when I saw him on the page, I was like, hello, I know you, you're my favorite character and you're here. So why did you decide that Diomedes was also going to speak? Because a lot of people reference him and then they're like, he was also there in the background with Odysseus. And you're like, no, he can have some lines. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just qu kind of interested in having Odysseus next to Diomedes because <laughs> the problem with Odysseus, and I love Odysseus, he's incredibly charming, but he's also quite cruel. And I think, you know, he's the perfect Machiavellian character. Uh, he thinks that the ends justify the means. And um, he's another example of a very, very famous character who was quite challenging to write because people had their own versions of Odysseus in their minds already. Um, so it was quite interesting to me to write Odysseus next to someone like Diomedes because Diomedes is the typical Greek hero. He's very strong. Um, he's quite... Well, he's not arrogant, but um, he kind of embodies the idea of like the perfect Greek hero, uh, the one who's known for his strength, who, well, doesn't talk too much. He reminds me of Menelaus in, in some way, uh, in the sense that he's quite silent, but has this very strong presence. Whereas Odysseus is not a typical ancient Greek hero, but still we love him for it, right? Modern audiences love Odysseus because he's sneaky, because he's cunning, because he's manipulative. Um, he's not heroic at all, not in our sense of the word. Um, but so I was interested in having the two of them, one next to the other, and to have the women kind of fall for Odysseus in a way, fall for his language, fall for his tricks, but then to, well, I don't know how to say this without spoiling the novel, but to kind of realize that actually he's just as strong, he's just as cruel. And, you know, talking about the man in general in the novel, I think that's something that readers usually say, um, they like about the novel. I really didn't want to write men in a one-dimensional way. Uh, so you have the more like obvious choices. I, I included Aegisthus in the novel and Tantalus, um, and I wrote them as characters who are not Greek heroes at all. They are different, and that is why Clytemnestra loves them. Um, Aegisthus has really suffered, like his reputation has really suffered. Um, in the ancient Greek myth, he's always portrayed as this kind of creepy, disgusting character. Um, I was interested in him because I always thought, well, Clytemnestra, she doesn't necessarily fall for him, but she has a relationship with him. So why would he be creepy and disgusting? Uh, it doesn't make sense that they just, you know, bond because uh, she wants revenge on her husband. There, there needs to be something more there. Because at the end of the Agamemnon, literally the last line of the play is the two of them ruling together. She tells him, you and I, we rule this house now. So she must have been interested in him. She must have cared for him in some way. Um, so yes, writing him was a way for me to have a man who is quite complex, morally speaking, and quite layered and not just a brute. Uh, Tantalus, Clytemnestra's first husband, is another easier example in the sense that he is, um, well, he is not Greek and as such, the Greeks kind of hated him in a way, but for Clytemnestra, he embodies a different word, a different way of thinking, a different mindset. He's someone who doesn't value strength above all else, he do who doesn't value cruelty above all else. Um, and then there are the other characters, you know, you have someone like Agamemnon. Obviously, Agamemnon is really hard to write because he is, there's no way around it. He's just a very bad guy. He's incredibly cruel. Um, and I hate Agamemnon, just like everyone else. But I think I was also interested in exploring why he's so powerful. Because he is the leader of the Greek forces during the Trojan War. He is the most powerful Greek man. Um, and so I think my way into, into his character was, why is he the leader? What does he have that other people characters don't have and there are you know there are so many lines in the novel there are a lot of conversations between Clytemnestra and Agamemnon and one of my favorites is when um, Agamemnon tells Clytemnestra people have never given me anything so I learned to take the things that I wanted and you know to some people that might sound like it, it's obviously it shows how cruel he is how brutal he is but also it shows you why he was respected in a way. I was quite interested in, in really exploring how he exercises power, why he has become so powerful, and to compare that to the kind of power that Clytemnestra has. So yes, he's cruel, because <laughs> we cannot deny it. Even in the ancient sources, he's described as cruel. He's 
always called a hero, but always called a bad man. Um, but I also wanted to make sure that he wasn't just one dimensional. I know, same thing for all the other male characters. Um, I think the only guy who doesn't really come out well is Theseus because he makes just an appearance and he does something horrifying. But, you know, you can't really root for Theseus. Um, so, yeah, I think in general, with both the female characters and the male characters, I was interested in morally kind of complex characters, characters who weren't just good or bad guys, because that is also how they were portrayed in the ancient sources. I think sometimes people just assume that we are we're telling these stories because the women were just so one dimensional. But if you look at a character like Helen in the ancient sources, she wasn't one dimensional at all. Same thing for Penelope or, or Clytemnestra. Um, I think the problem was that throughout the centuries, they became one dimensional because they became cliches and kind of embodiments of the bad wife, the bad lover, the bad mother, and so on and so forth. I couldn't agree with that more, but when you go to the source material, these women are so fascinating. And like a lot of the stuff doesn't survive where maybe we get the end of a woman's story, but in the same way, you know, we don't have a lot of things for men as well. We don't know if we just take Diomedes because we've been talking about him. We don't know how that story ends. We just know he made it home alive. And then his name appears in the Aeneid, which is then Roman. So that's about it though. So with all these women though, in the source material, they're so rich. And as you said, there's some weird gap in the middle where something happened that they became like Helen's just vain or Helen's just selfish. It's like, well, there's a little bit more to that character than just that. Yeah. And I think, you know, with Clytemnestra specifically, she really suffered at the hands of the Roman tradition. I think that's how, as much as I love the Roman tradition, uh, but Clytemnestra was kind of deprived of emotive. Uh, she just becomes this kind of like lustful, murderous uh, woman. Um, and... The, the Roman poets, the Roman authors never really talk about the fact that Iphigenia was killed, uh, which is why she becomes kind of one dimensional. Um, but obviously you have, we obviously have to consider the sources within the context in which they're written. And that's what made sense to them when, when, when they were writing about Clytemnestra, that's the kind of thing they wanted. So, um, but yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, sticking with Iphigenia. So I've spoken about the death of Iphigenia with two other authors who have tackled this. But both of them were mothers. So one of them is Hannah Lynn, who wrote A Spartan Sorrow. And one of them was obviously Jennifer Saint, who did Electra. But again, both of them were mothers. So my question to them about this was like, how could you write this? Like, how did that feel? You are not a mother. So I want to ask you, though, did you well, find you with that scene? No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, plot twist, guys, actually. <laughs> this is the unveil. <laughs> but since you're not, though, did you find it not easier because it's still a really tough scene, but not having a child, was that scene maybe easier to really step into Clytemnestra's shoes and figure that out? Because you didn't have that emotional like connection there. That's quite hard to answer in the sense that I think sometimes we have this idea of writers um, as people who write what they know. I remember when I was doing creative writing courses and they kept telling me, write what you know, write about your own experience. I don't really approach writing like that. I think... I think Hilary Mantel has the most amazing quote on this. She says, when you write historical fiction, the right way, the, the way, well, the way to write characters is to inhabit them, to act them from the inside out. And she compares writing to acting, which is exactly how I feel when I'm writing a novel. When I write a character, I become, I write because I am obsessed with that character. I write because I spend my entire day thinking about that character. I started thinking about Clytemnestra when I was 16 years old and I never stopped. Like literally, not just when I was writing this book, but every single week of my life, I thought about her. I love her completely. And I think she is someone who has done some very bad things. But when I was writing about her, I kept thinking that she was just right. And I think you need to be obsessed with your character. You need to be, to, to be in love with your character in order to, well, you don't have to be in love with your character, but you know, when you write a retelling, that is truthful, that's how you need to feel. And um, I was telling you before that the first thing I felt when I was learning about this myth was rage. I was really, really angry, which is which makes perfect sense because this is a story about vengeance and fury and rage. Um, and I think that was my way into the character. Um, when I was 
every day when I was writing about her, I was really angry. Like that anger never left me. And that's what allowed me to inhabit the character completely. And I was not thinking, when I was writing the story, I was not thinking about me at all. <laughs> I was not thinking about, obviously there are some things that help me to connect with the character, you know, the idea of sisterhood, the idea, but those are just more practical things, I think. I, I was just thinking about Clyde Nestor. I was literally trying to inhabit her word completely. And I was not looking at her through my own eyes. I don't know, I sound like a mad woman now, but it was just about, you know, inhabiting the ancient word and then trying to think as she was thinking. And um, I think that's what allowed me to find kind of the emotional core of the novel and the emotional pull. Cause I think what I really love in a historical novel or in a Greek retelling is those novels that have like literally that they're doing you can tell that the authors have done a huge amount of research but that also have an emotional heart and an emotional pull i think song of achilles and cersei are incredible in this respect because not just because of the research in terms of the concepts and the events but also the language the language that mimics and that kind of recreates the the language of the ancient sources but also because they add like an extra layer of emotion there you read the story and you become obsessed with these characters you dream about them and this is also probably why tiktok is filled with you know <laughs> young men and women just sobbing after there is song of achilles because it, they have you know that extra layer of emotion and i think and i don't think Marley miller found that because she obviously she's a woman and Patroclus is a man you know I, I think it was just about inhabiting that character it's just like acting I think it was more about kind of forgetting who I am and thinking like her and just becoming obsessed with her so then keeping on character stuff I wanted to talk about Leon because this is I thought such a nice addition to the novel so where did the inspiration for Leon come from so he's a character I made up, actually one of two characters I made up. Well, I'm thinking him and then Aileen, who is um, Clytemnestra's kind of servant. And um, well, she starts out as a servant and becomes so much more than that. But um, Leon specifically came from my interest in exploring Clytemnestra's sexuality and her relationship with men because um, she is a very passionate character. Um, I... And I also wanted to show readers how different her relationships with men were. You have Tantalus, you start out with Tantalus, she falls in love with this foreign king, um, doesn't end well, little spoiler alert. Um, and then and then she's kind of traumatized by what happens. And for a very long time, um, she doesn't love anyone, She except for her children. She doesn't allow herself to love anyone else. Um, and then obviously I knew I had to explore her relationship with Aegisthus uh, because that's a big part of the myth. Uh, but I wanted something in between. So it wasn't necessarily a, con a conscious choice. So it's not that I was writing thinking, oh, I want to put this into the narrative. Um, I think I wrote the character of Leon for a couple of scenes and then I just thought, oh, this would be a great way to explore how she is slowing, allowing herself to have a relationship with another man while her husband is away. But also, I think it was a way for me to show her grief for Iphigenia because the interesting thing is that when Iphigenia dies, the only person who's there with Clytemnestra, and this is not the myth, this I made this up, by the way. <laughs> this doesn't exist in the ancient sources. But um, the, in in my novel, the only other person who's there with Clytemnestra is Leon, and I think grief really <laughs> forces people together in a weird way sometimes. And because he's there with her, I think they end up together in a way because they are the only ones who know how the other fell. They are the only ones who know about. The, the the horrifying tragedy that happened because they were there uh other people suffer Electra suffers obviously she has lost a, sis a sister Orestes suffers Chrysotemy suffers but they they were not there they don't know how horrifying the whole uh the whole thing was um so that's how I came up with Liam so were there any characters as you were writing that surprised you that like you went into this with rage like for Clytemnestra like I'm gonna do her justice was there anyone that sort of came up that you were like oh actually they're fun too, and I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I think um, a couple of examples would be Iphigenia and Electra, Clytemnestra's daughters. And that is because in the first draft of my novel, Iphigenia was quite uh, just beautiful and innocent, and um, she was not fierce uh, like her mother. And I think I, I wrote her like that because 
that's how she's portrayed in the ancient sources so I, I was not I was just trying to reproduce how she was um, in the ancient sources and then I remember that I was rereading the whole thing uh, for my second draft this was years ago before submitting to um, to agents and editors and I realized that it just didn't work because uh, she was too one-dimensional and I had read so many depictions of women like that in other historical novels and other retellings, I was like, no, this is not going to work. If I if I want to submit this novel, it needs to have a cast of fierce women where every single woman is complex and she's not one dimensional at all. And so I changed her and um, I actually kind of explored this idea that after her death, she becomes this one dimensional virgin, innocent virgin who sacrificed. Uh, Electra was even more interesting because it is very easy to hate Electra. Uh, people usually hate Electra. Obviously, she spends the entire time in the ancient sources hating her mother uh, and just justifying her father, who is probably the worst character from Greek mythology. Um, but when, I think when I was writing this, I, I had to empathize with every single one of my characters. I couldn't... Just because I was writing it for Clyde and Nestor's perspective, it, it, it doesn't mean that I could insult or hate hate the other characters whenever there was a scene with uh, between Electra and her mother I had to understand Electra and I had to understand her perspective as well so for me the the key to <laughs> not justifying but understanding and empathizing with Electra was to move away from the idea that she just um keeps loving her father uh, but I was more interested in how frustrated she must have been as a child with a mother who loves Iphigenia, obviously. Um, and, you know, there's this whole idea in the book. I keep exploring the fact that Clytemnestra doesn't think she has a favorite child, but everyone keeps telling her everyone has favorites. So you, surely you do have a favorite as well. And um, and also this idea of Electra being jealous of her sister, which reproduces the idea of Helen being jealous of Clytemnestra when they were younger in the first part of the novel. And... Um, there is a scene that I added very, very later, actually, very later on, um, just during the final um, edits. And it's it's just a descriptive scene of Clytemnestra looking at her daughters as they fight. She wakes up and her daughters are fighting and she says, every morning is the same. Iphigenia does things. Uh, she's incredibly ambitious, very competitive. People love her. She's like a light wherever she goes. And Electra follows her. And on the one side, she's jealous of her because she sees her sister uh, being admired, being loved, being respected. But on the other side, she just realizes that without Iphigenia, her word would be gray and musty and 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 dark. And so she she loves her sister, but also hates her for it. And then when Iphigenia dies, Electra realizes that. Well, she doesn't realize because that's not a realization. She she assumes that her mother would have wanted her dead rather than Iphigenia. And there's even a line when she says, uh, "Sometimes I think." you would have loved to have made that rather than my sister. And, you know, it's obviously Clytemnestra doesn't think that she loves her daughter. But when when a person starts having a thought like that, it's just like a rotten thought like that. It just doesn't, it never makes you rest. And I think that was my way into Electra, this idea that she's just constantly haunted by thoughts that she, that don't let her rest. Um, so she did surprise me in a way. I, I did end up um, understanding her and empathizing with her as soon as I moved away from the, you know, I love my father narrative. So winding down this interview now, we're going to kind of come back to the beginning of this chat because I just remembered that I had a question there. And as you were talking earlier, I was thinking about this. So we're going to tie this back to the start. Do a nice loop, guys. We'll bring it all the way back full circle. So when it comes to more so the structure of the book, when talking about how different this book is, it is just structured differently to like other mythological retellings that are very neat, that are very, that was gonna sound bad, so I'm not gonna say that, but like just, just very, just very organized, organized, you know? So it is different in, in that way. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that, just for people who haven't maybe seen the book. I have lots of viewers in the US and that's only coming out soon. Uh, in the US. So that's very exciting. So can you give us a little glimpse into the structure of how different that is? Yeah, the structure kept changing, actually. It started out with, so the book originally had three parts. Um, but then I, 
in my kind of main structural edit, I changed it into five different parts. And originally I had two quotes that introduced the whole book, which is something that authors often do. They put it their favorite quotes at the very beginning. And then my editor was like, nope. So I thought about rather than having quotes from the ancient sources, because those, as we said before, I wove those quotes into the narrative itself. I thought about writing um, a couple of poems that would in a way be inspired by, by the ancient sources. And so you have five different parts. And in in the first part, you have a poem that is about, it talks about female power and how powerful women are perceived versus how powerful men are perceived, which is something that, as I said before, is quite a big theme in the novel. Um, something that, you know, we haven't talked about, but I, I just love writing about is this idea that as a society, we're still not comfortable with the idea of a powerful woman. We just can't find them likable. And we whenever we have a powerful woman, we just assume that she has to think like a man to act like a man. And Clayton is just a perfect example of this because even in the ancient sources, she's always described as manly, thinking like a man. Um, it's as if we just don't have a template for how a powerful woman looks like. So we just assume she has to look like a man. Um, and so I think that that initial poem was inspired by this whole idea of female power and then there's another poem um at the beginning of part three which i wrote and which uh is was inspired by the prophecy i was talking about before so the prophecy that we have in hesiod and sesicarus that talks about the three women the three daughters of leda um and then there are two little quotes um that i translated from the agamemnon by aeschylus um one is um just an exploration of the idea of fate and how and this is just a, an idea that keeps coming up in Greek mythology in in the ancient sources how no man can be too happy no man can be too lucky um and then there's another one which is probably my favorite quote from the Agamemnon it's something that Cassandra tells the elders right before she dies um the elders keep asking her questions and she this is in the Agamemnon um, and she says I'm gonna die Agamemnon is gonna die someone is gonna kill us and the elders ask her which man honor is the word they use the ancient Greek word for man which man is gonna do the deed and she says no you you haven't been listening to me you're wrong she will kill me and then she says she the lioness who mates with the wolf when her lion king is missing um, which is just such a beautiful quote this idea of you know comparing Clytemnestra to a lioness and it's something that I have embedded in in the narrative as well um so yeah that's the general structure um it might seem quite complicated at first but I think it also follows Clytemnestra's um rise to power in a way that um allows the readers to see her change from this confident loved daughter and loved princess beloved princess to a ruthless um queen who raises loyalty and <laughs> hates <laughs> the people who don't respect her in a way. Okay, I hate to do this because I really want to reply to what you just said. However, we are running out of time. I'm really conscious of that. I'm really aware of that. So why don't we just sort of roll into the final question, the way that I normally end these conversations, which is asking you to give our viewers a little piece of advice. Now for you, obviously you wrote a Greek mythology retelling, you're currently working on your second novel. So for anybody who's watching that either wants to write a Greek mythology retelling, or maybe just wants to write in general, wants to publish a book, what is the advice that you can give to that person? That's a, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> I have many answers to that. I think specifically in terms of Greek mythology retellings, um, I love the idea of telling people, I always say this to people, uh, we are just paying homage to a tradition that already existed in the ancient world. Uh, Greek mythology, each story has so many different versions in the ancient sources already. I The example of Helen that I mentioned before is the perfect example. So uh, the idea of retelling stories is part of the ancient Greek tradition. And this is because these stories were transmitted by oral tradition. And so each time it, the story was told, it changed slightly. Um, so when you retell these myths, you shouldn't you shouldn't be too afraid to change tiny things. I am someone who <laughs> I I love accuracy, I love historical accuracy, but so many people change things, and it is quite interesting to see their perspectives. Um, I also I also <laughs> always talk about 
um, one of my favorite things, which is the ancient Greek word for myth, which is mythos. And it has so many different meanings. It means story, uh, legend, fact, fiction, any story transmitted by word of mouth. But it also, um, it also means public speech. And the first time it appears is in the Odyssey, in the very first book of the Odyssey, when um, Telemachus and Penelope are listening to a bard uh, a bard who is uh, singing of all the Greek heroes who are trying to come back home after the Trojan War. And Penelope doesn't really like the story. She's quite stressed about her husband already. <laughs> and she asks the bard to sing another song. And then the bard doesn't have time to reply because Telemachus interrupts her and said, it interrupts uh, Penelope, interrupts his mother and says, shut up, mother, go back to your to your own rooms, go back to your weaving. Speech will belong to the men. Um, especially me, because I'm the master of this house. And the word he uses is mythos, um, which I always find incredibly interesting because right now there are so many women rewriting the stories. And in a way, it's as if they're reclaiming this power that was stolen from us, uh, public speech. <laughs> um, but I think, so this is specifically for myth retellings. Don't be afraid to change the story slightly because people have been doing it for hundreds of years. Um, but also do your research. Uh, research is the most important thing. Um, in terms of writing in general and just, you know, getting an agent, what I always say uh, is that if, if you work really, really hard and if you tell a story that is something that you feel like you need to tell, then you you just need to you just need to approach this as a job as a proper job i remember when i was submitting to agents no one had taught me i had done so many creative writing courses but no one had taught me how to um find an agent how to write a cover letter how to write a proper pitch i still remember writing my first pitch for Gladenestra, like a one line pitch and just study like learn how to write a pitch how to write a synopsis but i believe that if you work really really hard and if you approach it in the right way doing lots of research whether it's for the book or for the submission then and you really believe in it then you will you'll find you will find a way to do it um but yeah i think my main my main advice is always do a lot of research write about something that is that you really feel passionate about, don't write something just because it's a trend. I think sometimes people think, oh, this is trending, now I want to write about this. Um, I think most of the authors who are being published now, not just me, were thinking about these characters and writing about these characters from, you know, before, uh, have been thinking about these characters for a very long time, which is why these stories are, are so much loved even now. Um, but yeah, find a story that you think you're the right person to tell and and empathize with your character and become obsessed with your character, as I was saying before. And I think if you really love your character and your story, readers will will love her or him too. Okay, Constanza, that was a gorgeous place to leave this video. So thank you so, so much for joining me today to discuss your gorgeous book. Thank you guys, as I say in every single video, thank you guys for watching, of course. And if this chat has convinced you to buy the book, which it should, that's obviously the point of all of these chats, you guys can find all of the links in the description below to purchase Clytemnestra on various platforms, as well as finding its Goodreads and, as per normal, all of Costanza's social media profiles. So you guys can find all of those in the description below. But thank you guys so much for tuning in, and we'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on Moan Inc. So I'll see you guys then.